If you're in jail for a nonviolent offense, of course you want to get out. But if the judge sets a bail you can't afford, you've got some decisions to make. Um, I have a daughter, so like priorities are like formula, diapers, and wipes, not me getting out. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. I'm John Dankowski. We'll take a look inside the bail system in New Hampshire. We'll also meet some workers taking part in Greater Boston's building boom, workers who might be exposed to asbestos. We'll talk to author Colin Woodard about why reliably blue Yankeedom just went red enough to help Donald Trump become president. He was promising that the government would intervene in order to improve lives, revive manufacturing, build more infrastructure. And if the Trump administration makes good on promises to reform immigration policy, what will that mean for the thousands of foreign students studying in New England? And they're really close to doing all these great, amazing, crucial things, but they're very worried because they have to reapply for their visa. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region, with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Coming up, how does the author of American Nations view an electoral map that shows reliably blue Yankeedom playing a role in the election of Donald Trump? We'll talk with Colin Woodard. But first, our reporter Emily Corwin has been covering racial disparities in the criminal justice system in southern New Hampshire. It's a rapidly diversifying area in a mostly white state. But aside from race, there are other disparities, too, like basic economics. For instance, on any given day in the jail in Manchester, there could be several dozen people held on bail of $1,000 or less. Most of these people are charged with low-level offenses and would be back at home if they could afford the money bail. It's a system that's been eliminated in other states and cities. Here's Emily's story. The day I met Chris Weber, he was wearing a beige jumpsuit in the jail library, studying for his GED. Last year, the 19-year-old spent a total of two months behind these bars. His record includes two convictions, one for trespassing, the other for resisting arrest. But that's not why he was locked up. He was locked up because he's missed court dates. That, and he's poor. When I met him, Weber was being held on $500 cash bail for the month leading up to his rescheduled hearing. And why can't you pay the $500? Um, I have a daughter, so like priorities are like formula, diapers, and wipes, not me getting out. New Hampshire's judges are supposed to let you go home while you wait for hearings and trials, except in two circumstances. One, if the judge thinks you're a threat to public safety. Or two, if they think you might not show up for court. That's where money bail comes in. Requiring bail, especially relatively low bail, allows people in Category 2, the flight risks, a way to go home. You put down a deposit and you have an incentive to come back for court. But what if the judge sets a bail you can't afford? Sorry. It's okay. This is Weber's four-month-old baby girl and her mom, Catherine Sprints. You're okay. If they had the money, Sprint says, Weber would be home. Instead, he spent weeks behind bars. Like, he, he missed her birth. She's going to know when she's older that her dad wasn't there. According to an NHPR analysis of jail data spanning two years, 62 or so people are held at Valley Street Jail each day because they can't afford bail of $1,000 or less. More than half of these are charged only with nonviolent offenses like drug possession, trespass, and resisting arrest. Chief Justice Tina Netto oversees the state's felony-level courts. She's seen a lot of people who miss court dates, people like Chris Weber. When people don't show up for court, it's usually because they forgot or they've moved or they lost their transportation, you know, those kinds of things. They aren't generally trying to skip town because they want to avoid process. Being in jail has documented consequences. It can lead to job loss and eviction. Research shows doing time makes people more likely to commit other crimes. And for those held pre-trial, jail also increases the likelihood a defendant will be found guilty of a crime, will plead to a charge, and will be sentenced to time behind bars. And yet, Judge Neto says money bail is the only system most New Hampshire judges have to make sure even low-level defendants appear. We're using a lot of resources, um, continuing hearings, having witnesses and folks come back to court because the offender's not appearing. Other places are trying to help defendants show up for court. In New York City, defendants now receive text message and phone call reminders about court summons, so it's harder to forget. One court implemented evening hours for people with jobs. 
Some states have made more fundamental changes. The District of Columbia eliminated money bail altogether. New Mexico and New Jersey have recently overhauled their bail systems, too. So what's the holdup in New Hampshire? There is a real interest, I think, in finding uh, a solution to this issue. Devin Chafee heads up the New Hampshire ACLU, which is part of the state's interbranch Justice Council. That group has identified bail reform as a priority. Yet some of the tools used to replace money bail have had mixed results. That's why Chafee says the first step is figuring out who is being held on bail now and why. Because if New Hampshire is really going to consider bail reform seriously, then we need to have a sense of what the baseline is so we can evaluate the impact of any reform measures that are adopted. This has not been easy. Last year, the New Hampshire Department of Justice got federal funding to hire a nonprofit to get all that data. But inconsistent jail software meant the study only covered part of the state. How to proceed now is still unclear. In the meantime, people like Chris Weber are waiting behind bars. That's Emily Corwin from New Hampshire Public Radio reporting. You can see some of the data behind her story at nextnewengland.org. A bit south of Manchester, all across the greater Boston area, demolition crews are taking down walls, sometimes entire buildings, in one of the biggest construction booms in decades. But there are concerns that this rampant renovation is creating a new wave of workers who are exposed to an old enemy, asbestos. Beth Daly of the investigative news unit The Eye and WBUR reporter Martha Biebinger begin their story on the fourth floor of a building in Boston's downtown crossing. Here's Martha. Henry Aguilar, a 32-year-old Guatemalan, stopped short when he saw the cracked brown tiles stuck to carpet he was ripping out. I don't know that much about asbestos, but I mentioned it to the boss. I think this might be asbestos. And he said, no, it's fine. The next day, after working without a required respirator or protective clothing, after sweeping up broken tiles and tossing them into a dumpster, after wearing dusty work clothes home to hug his two young nieces, Aguilar says his boss at Skinner Demolition revised that answer. Then he told me it was asbestos, but the job was already done. Two of Aguilar's co-workers confirmed his account. We tested the tile. Aguilar had stuck a piece in a plastic bag, which Beth took to ProScience, an environmental lab in Woburn. Pat Weekly looked at the tile under a microscope. She saw chrysotile, the most common type of asbestos. It's a very soft, silky fiber. It has kind of a satiny sheen. It's rather pretty. And potentially deadly. Aguilar's broken piece of brown tile was 7% asbestos. That's a pretty high number. When we cut it, we can see all these fibers poking right out of it. If a worker raises questions about asbestos, state officials say their employer is supposed to stop the job and check. An attorney for Skinner Demolition says the company is investigating Aguilar's allegations. WBUR and the I investigated too. We found that Aguilar is likely one of hundreds, possibly thousands of employees who are handling asbestos in Massachusetts without the required protections, putting themselves and the public at risk. The state issued almost 24,000 asbestos permits in 2015, a more than 50 percent increase over five years. And those are just the licensed projects, not the ones that turned out to be asbestos, like Aguilar's tiles. While the volume of projects was building toward an all-time high, the state of Massachusetts was trimming inspector jobs and losing experienced asbestos staff. The number of environmental inspections dropped by 50 percent. Fines shrank even more. And no one in 50 interviews we conducted says that's because the industry is doing a better job of protecting workers and the public from asbestos. Now, some public health experts warn that lax oversight amid a surge in renovation could trigger a new wave of asbestos disease and death. The problem is, we won't know for 10 to 40 years. Asbestos festers. About 10 percent of workers will develop asbestosis, which is permanent scarring of their lungs. One percent will learn they have mesothelioma, a cancer that typically kills patients in one to three years. I have a breathing tube down my throat. In three chest tubes, I keep my lung inflated to take out uh, fluids that might be in there and so on and so forth. Mike Denon, who's 63, describes a picture of himself in the ICU last December, his second major surgery after he was diagnosed with mesothelioma. 
Now, after six rounds of chemotherapy, he's trying to build stamina by lifting weights and walking. It'll, it'll draw you down to points where you don't know if you're going to be able to carry on or not. Asbestos is not dangerous as long as tiles or insulation containing the mineral are left intact. Denon says the fibers that lodged in his lungs may have flown out of pipe insulation he removed on Martha's Vineyard back in the 1980s. Just four years ago, doctors diagnosed mesothelioma. A handful of European countries track the health of asbestos workers from the time of their first exposure. In the U.S., asbestos workers are supposed to have annual breathing exams, but we could find little evidence this happens routinely. Denon says he should have been screened because many employers knew asbestos was present and dangerous. Companies took uh, profits over people's health and well-being, and, and people were dying. I mean, yeah, and people are still continue to die. This year, in Massachusetts, inspections and fines are rising again. Department of Environmental Protection Deputy Commissioner Gary Moran says the agency is building an experienced staff and getting more agents out to sites. We prioritize our inspection activity based on complaints targeting bad actors. Um, So we do think we adequately address public safety. Um, we, We think we have been able to do that effectively. But in the midst of a demolition boom, some inside the asbestos industry say cutting corners to avoid safety expenses is common. If you're trying, it costs money. Everything you see costs money. Alan Olson owns the Olson Company in Methuen, which does asbestos removal. He and other companies estimate safety measures done right can be 20 percent of a project's cost. Olson flicks on an air pump. Under federal regulations, a sample of workers must wear the device to determine how much asbestos is in the air. Olson says some of his competitors who underbid him skip this test or don't seal rooms to contain asbestos dust or don't provide respirators. There's workers out there that are being exposed. They shouldn't be. They're... they're, um Their occupants in the building are being exposed. It's time that this industry does get cleaned up because the general public is the one that's that's suffering in the long run. There are more than 4,000 new cases of asbestos-related diseases in the U.S. every year. That rate was supposed to have peaked by now, more than 40 years after the federal government drafted rules to limit asbestos exposure. But it has not. We asked Dr. Ralph Bueno, chief of thoracic surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital, when he thinks asbestos-related lung disease and cancer will fade away. I don't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just, I just don't know. Bueno says it's hard to predict because we cannot measure exposure to asbestos from demolition, and we don't check to see which imported products contain asbestos. I'm not trying to be a scaremonger, but uh, we just don't know. It may not be a problem. But it's very hard to answer your question. Experts say as older cities are renovated, there are some established facts. Asbestos is the most common cause of occupational cancer. According to federal standards, there is no safe level of exposure. Cora Roloff, an independent occupational health researcher, says there are some unknown risks you face when you take a job. Asbestos is not one of them. This is not a mystery. We can prevent exposure. We know how to do it, and we know that asbestos and exposure at work is harmful. This is like number one preventable disease, so we should do it. Some health experts say the U.S. should join the 58 other countries that have banned asbestos. But Henry Aguilar, who found the asbestos tiles in downtown Boston, says workers need more help with the threat they face on the job now. He's worried. Mostly for my family. It's contamination that I'm bringing home. The company Aguilar works for, Skinner Demolition, declined further comment. Workers there voted recently to unionize, hoping for better pay and safety protection. Eleven Skinner workers have filed a state discrimination complaint alleging they were not paid sufficient wages and were not protected from asbestos. There are roughly 3,400 licensed asbestos workers in Massachusetts and an unknown number exposed to asbestos through general demolition. Amid a maze of rules that often aren't closely monitored, it may be decades before we know whether scarred lungs or cancer are the legacy of this reconstruction renaissance. That's Martha Biebinger of WBUR and Beth Daly of The Eye reporting. To check out their follow-up story about investigations into whether many of these workers are risking their health and then not getting paid, go to nextnewengland.org. Coming up, we'll talk to author Colin Woodard about why reliably blue Yankeedom 
just went red enough to help Donald Trump become president. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and global warming. If you're a regular listener to our show, you might have caught our interview with writer Colin Woodard. He's the author of the book American Nations, a history of the 11 rival regional cultures of North America. His book imagines 11 distinct nations connected not by current governmental boundaries, but by a common culture. In his framework, the culture of each of these nations derives from the philosophy and the way of life of the people who originally colonized the region. Borders have changed. For instance, the region Woodard calls Yankeedom expanded westward from New England to upstate New York and all the way to Minnesota in the 1700s up to about 1850. But the characteristics that make up a region's culture, according to Woodard, stay the same and even show up in the way we vote today. In a recent piece in the Portland Press-Herald, Woodard explains the presidential election through the American nation's framework, including why some typically Democratic areas in Yankeedom, like the 2nd District of Maine, flipped for Trump this year. Colin Woodard joined us from the studios of Maine Public Radio in Portland. Welcome back to Next. Thanks for having me back. Let's start by getting the big picture on what happened during the 2016 election from your standpoint. You've been looking at a lot of maps, obviously, including the maps of your American nations. And we've been looking at a lot of electoral maps, the ones that show red and blue across the nation. What are some of the big takeaways from the lens that you have on these maps through the American nations of of how Donald Trump became the next president of the United States? Well, I view things through the the notion that regionalism is an extremely important factor in understanding politics and analyzing elections. And the big problem we have is that we don't define our regions very precisely. The regional cultures trace back to differences in early settlement patterns by uh, different colonization waves coming from uh, different colonial clusters. And those things don't follow state boundaries. So the map that most people use in looking at regions is a bit faulty. And I look at it down at a county level. When you do that and you recognize the the actual boundaries of our regional cultures, things really do jump out at you in almost every um, hotly contested election we've ever had, uh, including this one. And the big takeaway pattern is that this election in its end result followed the same regional pattern one would expect from prior elections with the same regional cultures backing the more communitarian candidate, in this case, Hillary Clinton, and a group of other uh, cultures backing as they have the more individualistic minded candidate, in this case, Donald Trump. And these are some of the classic divides that we've talked about before and that make up the the ideas behind American nations. So let's just go through them one by one. Let's start where we are in Yankeedom, this region that began here in New England and stretches all across the top tier of Ohio and into Michigan and, and across the Great Lakes states of, of Minnesota and Wisconsin. It held for Hillary Clinton during this election, but not maybe in the same way, Colin Woodard, that it has in the past. Yeah, correct. So there were a couple of important differences when you dig down into the data. And one of the most critical things to understanding Donald Trump's Electoral College victory is looking at what happened in that greater New England cultural space. It went for Hillary Clinton, but only if you crunch the numbers by about eight points. And that's 11 points off Barack Obama's 2008 finish. It's quite a uh, significant shift. And the shift occurs in certain places. There were scores and scores of rural white counties that which by conventional political analysis are supposed to be voting Republican these days that don't and never have across New England uh, and including very rural places like the northern parts of uh, Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont in uh, upstate New York in the uh, upper tiers that were settled by Yankees and indeed in this whole area in the upper Mississippi Valley where Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Yankee settled part of Iowa and Illinois all come together. All of those places 
races voted by significant margins for Barack Obama in both 2008 and 2012. What was really different in this election is they all flipped and flipped strongly to Donald Trump. And that gave him the edge, uh, combined with low turnout in places like Detroit and Milwaukee, to actually capture by a a narrow margin uh, two Yankee states and their electoral college votes, Michigan and Wisconsin, and indeed uh, strip off one of Maine's four electoral college votes because Maine splits them in the uh, in the rural uh, uh, northern and eastern parts of the state. And that's a significant factor in understanding how he won on the margins uh, on the on the national map. What is it that's different about his candidacy that could account for those big shifts from the previous two elections in Yankeedom? Yeah, I've argued that writ large in our history, the the real question that is usually put before voters sort of philosophically and ideologically is whether the way forward, the best way to secure freedom is in individualistic terms. If there's less government and less regulation and less taxes, there will have to be more freedom for individuals. Or if it's in sort of community freedom terms, that in order to maximize the freedom of individuals, we need to uh, invest in maintaining and furthering a society where individuals can be free. Those are two very different philosophies. A successful liberal democracy actually mixes the two, but that's usually the choice. And a pretty plain choice that's put before voters in almost all our presidential elections in one form or another, save this particular one. That was the big difference in this one. Think about it. Donald Trump alone amongst the 17 Republican candidates for the nomination this year, the other 16 were all um, arguing for that less government, less taxes, less regulation. I will bring you more freedom. Donald Trump did not make those promises on the campaign trail. He was promising that the government would intervene in order to improve lives, revive manufacturing, build more infrastructure, replace Obamacare with something terrific, going against the free trade um, orthodoxy of his own party in many respects. And there appears to have been a very large response to that within the more communitarian-minded nations of Yankeedom. It is fascinating looking at the map that you have in your piece in the Portland Press-Herald, and we'll have links to it at nextnewengland.org, the difference between the, the Bernie Sanders impact during the primaries and then what happened during the general election. It shows up in, as you say, very stark relief when you take a look at the map and, and the impact <laughs> that he was having. Absolutely. Hillary Clinton was running as a successor to Obama, but in both the primary and the general election, she got tied to her husband, Bill Clinton's neoliberal legacy, which is much more of the free market approach and apparently quite unpopular these days within Yankeedom, whether you're looking at the Democratic primary electorate or indeed these areas I've described that flipped of these uh, areas that are rural and largely white and had voted for Obama twice and voted for Trump. I'd like to talk to you about some of the other American nations and to maybe revisit for some of our listeners some of the the differences that you have, including even in areas that abut closely Yankeedom. Again, if, if our region stretches from greater New England all across the top tier of the upper Midwest, we are bordered by two regions, New Netherland, which is essentially the greater New York area, and then the Midlands, which is the area through Pennsylvania, Ohio, and out into the Midwest that really provided the swing states, the ones in which both candidates spent an awful lot of time in. I'm wondering if you can talk about how you saw this election play out in our regional rivalries with these two uh, adjoining nations. New Netherland is the the Dutch founded area right around New York City, sort of New York City and its immediate counties around uh, northern New Jersey and elsewhere where the Dutch imprint runs deep. And the Midland area you describe was founded by the Quakers on the, you know, around Philadelphia and the shores of Delaware Bay. And it was supposed to be from the beginning multi ethnic and multi religious and, you know, a place where um, many cultures could live side by side with none of them dominant. And that was fine. And that particular settlement drive with a large number of German immigrants involved, settled the sort of middle part of Pennsylvania out through Pittsburgh and the middle tiers of Ohio and Indiana, Illinois, and then fans out into the heartland. And it's always been the great swing region, the kingmaker on our presidential map for a couple of reasons. One is that in the big competition between usually a New England-led coalition that is looking more around community freedom and the idea that we need to build a, you know, a successful uh, free society through investments in institutions and such. And on the other tier, you have the individualistic form that no government needs to 
to be restrained in, in as much as possible because they're the source of subjugating individuals. The Midlands is torn between those two things. It's very middle class and neighborly and community minded, but dating all the way back to the Quakers who'd been <laughs> oppressed in England uh, and, and in New England and elsewhere, there's a great distrust of top down government intervention. And so it's always been this sort of swing region. And this past November, you saw it swing very strongly away from from the Democrats and the more communitarian-minded candidates. They'd supported uh, Barack Obama by double digits in both elections. Uh, this time around, Hillary Clinton won the region, but by 0.4%. I mean, essentially, it was a tie across this swing region and an 11-point difference between Obama in 2008's margin in that region and her margin. And again, I think a lot of it has to do with Donald Trump having made a more communitarian-minded appeal, which went over very successfully in large parts of the Midlands. The Midlands is also important because it includes a chunk of several swing states. In fact, that's why they're swing states. Pennsylvania is divided between three regional cultures. One of them's the Midlands. Same with Ohio. And Ohio and Pennsylvania, if the Democratic candidate doesn't have a good margin in the Midlands, they're in a great deal of trouble because they have to counteract the greater Appalachian sections, which are highly individualistic and are going to vote against them in overwhelming numbers. The the other part of the country that I wanted to talk about that was founded by the Yankee influence is the area you call the left coast from, from the upper reaches of the Pacific Northwest down through a large part of California. And that, other than New, New Netherland, was the only other part of the country that very, very clearly was a Hillary Clinton landslide. What do you see as the impact of, of left coasters on this election? Uh, well, the left coast was founded by two sets of people, right? It's the area from, say, Monterey, California, up to Juneau, Alaska, just between the mountains and the sea. So it's shaped like Chile. It's a long strip along the ocean, shielded from the mountains. And it was settled in a different way than the interiors of California and Oregon and Washington and British Columbia were, because uh, it was settled by two different settlement streams. One was the New England stream arriving by sea and dominating many of the cities and towns in the Bay Area. And the other stream they were competing with, though, were people coming overland by wagon train who are almost all from the greater Appalachian parts of the Midwest. And so you had this hybrid culture that sort of combines the uh, greater New England mission to create a better society and do it through public institutions with the greater Appalachian emphasis on individual self-actualization and freedom. And yes, it went by an enormous margin for Hillary Clinton, 34 points more than anywhere else on the map. It went for Obama by about the same margin in the past two elections. But in Yankeedom, there was a big 11-point swing over that time period from the Democratic candidate to Trump. And I think the big difference is if you go trying to look for an equivalent of those swaths of scores and scores of rural white counties that we have in Yankeedom, where there's not a lot of diversity, you don't find that in the left coast. Even their rural counties are much more mixed culturally and ethnographically and racially. And the other element with Donald Trump in this election, which makes him unusual and has made many people quite frightened is that he wasn't running with the normal liberal democratic playbook, right? He was operating with many authoritarian promises, a sort of promises of a, of a European-style ethno-nationalist, that there will be protections that he and the government will, will help um, the good Americans, but that there are these other people who are, you know, traitors or, uh, or, or don't belong for whom maybe extra legal and extra constitutional measures might be brought forward, beatings at rallies, you know, arrests, uh, you know, religious tests for citizenship, and perhaps for federal judges serving on the bench. Those are very unusual things. We've never had a, um, a person elected president uh, who said those sorts of things. Now, there are many other things that Trump said and promised that we've discussed that were attractive to people, but they tended to be most attractive in counties where there weren't very many people who had good reason to feel they might be the targets of this wrath, that they might be part of the outgroup. That's less true across the left coast because you don't have that kind of uh, homogenous area. That a very interesting analysis actually gets us back to something you mentioned earlier, which is the idea that we really are becoming in so many ways an urban versus rural nation, even though we do have these big geographic differences in terms of the, the way our nations were founded. 
there are definitely differences in every country, every polity in the world between rural and urban. I mean, it's different ways of living with very different interests and relationships to the land and how one would use it. So you see those divides. I've always argued and continue to that that is not the central definitional and definitive divide in American politics. Now, this particular election, as you've pointed out, does show that. But if you were to trace and look back at this problem over you know, as many elections as you'd like, you would discover that this is a outlying data point, an unusual outlier for a lot of the reasons we've talked about already. If you go back, say, to the past two elections, say, with uh, Obama versus Romney or, or uh, Obama versus McCain, people were saying the same thing then. And I would continually point out, no, you have in, for instance, in Yankeedom, these scores of rural white counties that, in quotes, are supposed to vote for the Republican candidate who were voting for Barack Obama by wide margins, but only in Yankeedom and to some extent the Midlands, not in greater Appalachia and the deep south and the far west, the more individualistic areas. And by contrast, Mitt Romney won all sorts of major cities. But they were in particular regions. He won Dallas and Houston and Nashville, Cincinnati, Jacksonville, Oklahoma City. All of these places are in the individualistic nations. He had no such triumphs in the other regional cultures. So when you say, yeah, of course there's differences between rural and urban. There is in Japan and in France and everywhere you go. But if you start comparing the behavior of urban voters in certain regional cultures with those in in others, and you do the same thing for rural voters, that's where you see the great cultural differences between how they express their politics. Now, this election was sorted much more in the way that you described, but it's because in this election for the first time, one of the choices put forward, as I said, was an ethno-nationalist choice, um, which is directly puts front and center your your own identity and how it matches up to the, uh, the definition that's being put forward of the worthier real American. I just have one last question for you, and it has to do with your home state. So Maine is really interesting. It, it, half of Maine went for Donald Trump, or at least one of the Electoral College votes. And now we see in the last week or so, uh, L.L. Bean, the company that probably more people associate with Maine than just about uh, any other company is associated right. with the place, <laughs> coming out in, in favor of, of Donald Trump. What's it like to be a Mainer and, and what sort of conversations are you having about this, uh, this inauguration? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, in the L.L. Bean effect, it's been very frustrating for Mainers because L.L. Bean is a uh, pretty apolitical company. And those who live in Maine, it's very well known and its board are and the family members involved. It's a family of heirs to L.L. Bean who are divided politically. One wing of the family, including those who had the most managerial control in recent years, are Democratic donors and always have been. And the company has very, you know, enlightened policies and donating to the environment and uh, and to same sex couple benefits and all those things. And there's another wing of the family, uh, which Linda Bean is a part of, which is ultra conservative. Uh, her and her late mother, who are both on the board, donating to ultra right causes. You know, She was a member of the board and a personal friend of Phyllis Schlafly of the Eagle Forum and, mm-hmm. and was donating to Donald Trump. So th- it strikes most to Mainers how unfair it is that suddenly this company ends up you know, facing boycotts and stuff when it's in fact... Uh, not at all a you know a pro-Trump formation, but is trying desperately to remain apolitical. And then suddenly Donald Trump is linking them in his tweets uh, directly with Linda Bean and everything that they're trying to avoid doing. So I think in general, in Maine, there's been sort of that frustration as the outside world kind of dives in and is getting entirely the wrong impression of what's going on at the company and a desire for it all to go away and not be tweeted about. Colin Woodard is the author of American Nations, A History of the Eleven Rival Regional Cultures of North America. He also, of course, writes for the Portland Press-Herald, where you can read an analysis of the 2016 election, and we'll have links at nextnewengland.org. Colin, always good to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Great pleasure. Thanks for having me. Coming up, what will a Trump presidency mean for foreign students studying in New England? It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Melville Charitable Trust, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of housing and homelessness. 
We want to turn to one of the big question marks facing New England as Donald Trump takes office, immigration. And no, not his proposal to build a wall with Mexico or his talk about extreme vetting of Muslims. We're talking about a group that is big business to our region's many colleges and universities, overseas students here on visas. There are about 85,000 of these students in New England. That's out of more than a million who come to study in the U.S. each year. New England Public Radio's Jill Kaufman reports on some uncertainty about the future for these students who provide important resources in the most critical fields of study. Young men and women from China, India, Saudi Arabia, and Korea make up the largest number of international students coming to the U.S. Their top areas of study, science and technology research, engineering and math, known collectively as the STEM fields. Ultimately, anyone gets into STEM because they believe or at least they hope that they want to change the world. Archit Rastogi is doing his Ph.D. at UMass Amherst in molecular and cellular biology. At the moment, I'm working on studying how fetal exposure to certain environmental toxins can lead to diseases later in life. He's here on an F-1 visa, and he's part of a growing trend. A 2014 National Science Foundation report found the number of international students earning degrees in the STEM fields rose by 35 percent. The number of U.S. citizens, on the other hand, fell 5%. That's one reason international students are in demand at big research schools like UMass, UConn, and Brown. Another reason? Money. Their tuition is sometimes higher and often paid in full. And the STEM knowledge they bring allows schools to apply for millions in research grants. Otherwise, Rastogi says... Uh, without grant money, the university can't really function. Like, I don't know if you're aware of how grants work, but, you know, there's a set amount of money, like if it's a million-dollar grant, so you must will get $420,000 on that $1 million grant. I mean, the electricity, the machines, they're so expensive. And schools are recruiting hard. Going to college and studying in the United States has been a dream come true for us. As current F-status international students studying here in the United States, we know firsthand all the great things an American education can provide. Not only for us, but if you listen to the incoming president. I want the next generation of production and innovation to happen right here on our great homeland, America, creating wealth and jobs for American workers. And among his initial actions. On immigration, I will direct the Department of Labor to investigate all abuses of visa programs that undercut the American worker. International student visas are in the mix. Right after the election, university administrators like Ken Reed, who runs the International Student Program at UMass Amherst, began hearing from prospective students overseas and those on campus. I think something that none of us have completely comprehended yet is how this is going to impact international admissions. Sitting in his office, Reed points to a document written two years ago by U.S. Senator Jeffrey Sessions. I made these for you. This is for you, just in case it's helpful for you. Sessions is Trump's nominee for attorney general, and he's chair of the Senate Subcommittee on Immigration in the National Interest. He has some very specific things that really have potential impact on international students, Um, what's called OPT, or optional practical training, which is a work authorization that international students get after they complete studies. For career and research purposes, the OPT is really important, Reed says, and it can lead to a work visa known as an H-1B. But if postdocs can't continue that STEM-related work started as high-level graduate students, that research, which has been supported by federal and private money, might not make it out of academia. Reed says no matter what happens, enrollment levels won't stay the same. You know, we're at an all-time high for international enrollment in the United States, and statistically right now, to see the impact next year, it it should be pretty noticeable. Jobs are one thing, threats to national security another. Trump's original plan to stop all Muslims from entering the country has softened. He now calls his plan extreme vetting. Alan Goodman directs the International Institute of Education, which conducts an annual survey of foreign students. He says international students are among the most vetted visitors to the United States, Muslim or otherwise. After 9-11, the U.S. instituted the requirement that there be personal interviews for every visa seeker and holder. We have the staff today, we have the procedures, and the international students uh, coming here remain the most closely credentialed of any group of persons entering the United States. Over the past few weeks, schools in the U.S. sent out acceptance letters. And in about a month, prospective students will start responding yes or no. Will international graduate students be wary of coming to the U.S., of starting important work, 
only to potentially leave it unfinished? Archit Rastogi says he knows a lot of people who are at the very end of their PhDs. And they're really close to doing all these great, amazing, crucial things, but they're very worried because they have to reapply for their visa, and by the time they reapply for the visa, the administration will have changed. Rastogi says he came to the U.S. to do research in state-of-the-art labs that don't exist in India. He's got about four years left and eventually plans to return home. He's lucky, he says, his visa doesn't run out until 2021. That's Jill Kaufman from New England Public Radio reporting. 2017 marks the 10-year anniversary of an immigration raid that shook the town of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Officials from ICE arrested 361 immigrants who were working illegally in the U.S. at Michael Bianco, Inc., a leather goods factory that made gear for the military. Senator Ted Kennedy, who visited the families of the detainees, said the raid was evidence that the immigration system was broken and in need of reform. Here he is on WGBH television. We must enforce our nation's immigration laws, but the raids in New Bedford and elsewhere are merely a stopgap solution that unfairly penalize vulnerable workers in an already flawed system. The event gained national attention and fueled debate about immigration and labor rights. Most of those caught in the raid were deported. Independent producer Virginia Laura brings us the story of one woman who was allowed to stay. We're calling her by her middle name, Carolina. Carolina remembers the day. It was March 6, 2007, early in the morning. Carolina arrived at the Michael Bianco factory in New Bedford. She sat in front of her sewing machine and got to work. A few hours into her shift, all the entrances to the factory were blocked. Suddenly, officers in dark uniforms barged in. Everyone was ordered not to move. They came in, weapons and all, and I remember thinking, what's going on? And another woman shouting something at me. And when I looked, everyone was running to hide. Carolina didn't hide. She says she just sat there, trying to stay calm. On instinct, she pulled out her cell phone and dialed her babysitter. I said to her, I don't know what's happening, what they're looking for, maybe drugs, who knows, but please, please take care of my baby. She hung up. Then she heard officers yelling for people without documents to line up. Only then did she think, oh my God, this is immigration. The raid was conducted by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE for short. Hundreds of agents swarmed the premises. There were helicopters outside and Coast Guard ships standing by. It was the largest immigration raid in Massachusetts at the time. In total, 361 undocumented immigrants were arrested. Carolina was one of them. Carolina is from Guatemala. A few years ago, she fled the country because it was not a safe place. She left her two-year-old son behind with his grandmother. Carolina says it was an incredibly difficult choice, but she had to. She had to come to New Bedford to join her husband, who had immigrated earlier. Plus, and maybe more importantly, she had hoped she could eventually provide a better future for her son. Instead, she found herself on a factory floor, in handcuffs. Over the course of the day, Carolina and the others arrested were loaded on several buses. They were sent to an ICE facility for initial processing and fingerprinting. And I kept trying to cheer up the other women. You know, don't cry, don't cry, we're going to get out. I was like a rock. And that made me shut off my own pain and not shed a single tear until much later. But even as she cheered the others on, Carolina began to feel uneasy. Later that night, during the customary ICE medical examination, she was anxious. She felt a pressure on her chest. Carolina asked the nurse for the time. 3 a.m., she said. That's the time my daughter wakes up and I breastfeed her, and that's why I feel this anguish. My daughter is suffering. This is when she eats and I'm not there, and I know she's looking for me. Women with nursing babies at home were provided special treatment. Instead of being sent to a detention center, they were allowed to return to their children while they waited for their court hearings. But Carolina remembers they were asked for proof. They had to show photos of their babies or go into a bathroom and show an officer they could produce milk from their breast. She says immigration officers eventually decided she could go home. She left relieved and in shock. Back in her home, Carolina was in bad shape. 
As the days went by, she says she became more and more depressed. Con pesadillas. I had nightmares, was anxious. Con... I didn't want to talk to anyone. I locked myself away. But she knew she needed help. It took a long time and a great deal of effort, but she eventually found a pro bono lawyer to help her with her case. In order to help her, the lawyer needed all the details about her life in Guatemala. But Carolina had a hard time discussing them. Cuando a mí me pasan cosas I'd say to feas. the attorney, when bad things happen to me, I throw them aside. I don't want them with me. I want to look forward. I don't want to remember sad things about the past. A lot of people end up suicidal or killing themselves. You've got to look forward. But her lawyer kept telling her she couldn't help her unless she knew the whole story. So finally, Carolina began to open up and then felt even worse. Carolina says that when she started talking about what had happened to her, she got sick. She would get headaches, feel dizzy. She was referred to a psychologist and says sometimes after going over the details of her past, she would need to take pills to calm down. Eventually, her lawyer was able to draw the whole story out of her and realized Carolina might qualify for asylum. Gracias a Dios, ahora ya soy residente. Carolina is now a legal permanent resident. Her story has many twists and turns, but in the end, her asylum application was approved and she was allowed to stay. Why? Because she's Mayan. An ethnic indigenous group, the Maya, suffered a genocide during the Guatemalan Civil War. Beyond that conflict, Carolina herself was violently targeted and abused. In the end, a federal immigration judge deemed it unsafe for her to return to Guatemala. There was the terrible war, and I remember hiding and my mom telling me to be quiet, be quiet, and I was there silently trembling. Later, I'd walk past the ditch where they buried the bodies. I lived in shock. Carolina's story is a little ironic. She had been living in fear of being arrested and deported. But it was actually the arrest during the Michael Bianco raid that led to her becoming a legal permanent resident. Despite the violence she endured in her home country, leaving her two-year-old son behind almost broke her heart. So, when she became a legal resident, Carolina petitioned the U.S. government for him to move to the United States and join her. By then, he was 17. They granted her request. She vividly remembers seeing her son for the first time at Logan Airport. I was nervous when I saw him. I didn't know if to cry or to laugh. How did Carolina even recognize him after 15 years? His grandmother had sent a picture, and she also memorized the clothes his grandmother told her he'd be wearing. And I saw him from afar, and he smiled, and I smiled, so I knew that's him. <laughs> Here in the U.S., Carolina's son has had to adjust to a new life, new family dynamics, including living with a younger sister he hadn't met before. Carolina is happy to have her family together, but she worries for her kids, that they do well in school, that they stay out of trouble, and that they know they can talk to her about their problems. These days, Carolina works at a textile factory. She gets paid overtime, vacation, and sick days. But she feels deeply for those who are undocumented and continue to endure rough working conditions, like some of her friends, or neighbors, or other people she knows, living and working in New Bedford. You live in fear that at any moment immigration can come. It's even worse for those who have families, because who will take care of them, of your kids? I lived it, so I identify with them. That story was produced by Virginia Laura at the Transom Story Workshop. English translation was read by Nora Ritchie. For more stories about immigration and shifting identity in New England from our series Facing Change, go to nextnewengland.org. Next is produced at WNPR by Andrea Moraskin. The executive producer is Katie Pilarski. The digital editor is Heather Brandon. Production help this week from John Keimel, Rob Rosenthal, and Dan Mozzie. Our theme music is by composer Todd Merrill. You can hear more of his music at toddmerrill.com. And thanks to Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and powered by WBUR Boston. 
Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, Rhode Island Public Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, and WNPR 103.5.